This is Rock and Roll Grad School with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. Beth can hear them calling, but she won't pick up the phone. Hello, kitties. We're going to have a good time together. Or should I say we're going to have a real good time together? Well, I don't know, because sometimes you say I real, always... don't. And I feel like when you don't, people must think that it's not real good. Or when you say real good, maybe they think I... you're lying. These are all fair thoughts. Pretend today is a weekend day. Take your pick. Pretend we are in a giant grass and tree filled uh, open gathering spot. Pretend it's some sort of national holiday of celebration. Okay. Are you there? <laughs> I guess so. You look so dubious of all of this. I am. I'm concerned. You know, I've been accused of taking too long to walk a joke into the landing. That was a pretty long one. I feel like if if we get the chance to go around the block one more time, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, there's man selling ice cream, at least. Exactly. Singing Italian songs. Yes, exactly. So this week we talk with uh, Keith Howland from yes. the one and only Chicago. Do you know what we should have asked him about? His deep dish pizza. Mm. Oh, he's going to say Detroit style. I know. He probably would, just to twist the knife. Mm -hmm. But he was great. It was a lovely conversation. He was great. And he took us on a journey of what it's like to be on tour in a way that our other guests really haven't before. Exactly. So even if you think you don't like Chicago, which you probably just can't remember all of their hits, but there are so when he many started to remember some when, at least right when he started listing them off it was a, a oh i forgot about that one right there's so many what else is there to talk about musically is there anything in general or in general I mean, just, just in life in just in, in life just i think there's nothing left to talk about music so we should just hang it up right now we should yeah well i think um, one thing we could say and i think I've sort of tried to start teasing it out on some of our various social medias. If you are not subscribed to the show, you should do that because we have a really, really amazing lineup. The next, I don't want to say give it a, an end date. So anyone sees the next one and goes, Oh, screw that guy. Sure. But overall we have a very nice lineup coming in and um, a bunch of different genres, a bunch of different things. I think both of us, we're pushing for one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I, do we name some of them? Or do we just say? I do think we should start teasing them on social a little bit more. I was going to say, do we say we have a Dap King, a Fam, and a Pistol? Well, because you've been dying to say it. I have, but you know. But you could have said a Dap King, a Fem walk into a bar with a pistol. That's true. I'm, I'm just now trying to learn, relearn how to be on the road. You know, last night we got on the bus and it was about a seven hour bus ride. And I got in my bunk and with my iPad and started watching Star Trek reruns and football games and didn't sleep a wink. Of course. <laughs> and then they had a fire drill in the hotel at noon. No, of course. So I was dead asleep and that woke me up. So. <laughs> oh. welcome, welcome back to the road. The glorious, glamorous life of being on the road. Right. Uh, I, how are you guys doing? I No fire drills, so I can't oh, complain. Yeah, <laughs> good. Good. I, I did have a fire drill at a hotel once, though, in the middle of the night at the Soho Grand in New York, and that was a disaster. I had a very drunk boss at the time who came down in only a fur coat pounding on our door and then tried to stop the fire because they didn't, it wasn't an actual, it was, they thought it was a fire. 
So it wasn't a scheduled drill. And then she tried to stop the firemen to take pictures with her. We're like, hmm. Joe, you, you gotta yeah. get those guys upstairs so we can go back to bed. Yeah, and, and it's funny because our assistant tour manager called me before the fire drill and woke me up to tell me <laughs> no. there was going to be a fire drill. And the fire drill happened about 20 minutes later. And all it did was there was one chirp in my room. And that was the end of it. And I rolled over and went back to sleep. I was like, oh my God. thanks, Bill. Yeah. You know, if he hadn't called me, I probably wouldn't even have heard it. So, uh, oh, well. You said Welcome you're back. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said you're getting used to being back out on the road again. How long did it take you the first time to get used to sleeping on a bus? Because all I can think of is I get motion sickness and I feel like I would be miserable. Or does just doing that for X number of days and feeling nauseous, that just goes away after a while? You know, ironically enough, um, I used to get really motion sick, even on airplanes. Um, and initially, yeah, the tour bus was kind of a challenge because you're kind of bus surfing, you know, you've mm-hmm. got to see legs. And, and, um, but I, I did find, though, that, you know, if I get a bottom bunk, the top bunks tend to move more okay. because the bus is that's higher up. Right. So I, I always tried to get the bottom bunk because it's closer to the road, so it doesn't do as much movement. And, um, yeah, I seem to be fine with it. How does one claim a bunk on a tour bus? Like, do you have to get there first? Do you have to bribe the driver? Like, how how do you ensure you get that bunk? Well, you know what? I mean, ironically enough, when I first joined the band, so back then there were two buses. There was bus one and bus two. Bus number one was um, all the original guys. Uh, it was Walt, Jimmy Lee, and and Robert, and our tour manager. And bus two was everybody else, which was me, Jason Chef, Tristan Bowden, Bill Champlin, and then our assistant tour manager. And when I came in, I was replacing uh, Dwayne Bailey, who had been on that bus. So they basically just said, bottom left bunk, backside, that's your bunk. So it became my bunk for 20 some odd years now we've just in recent couple of years we've changed up now we have three buses but i still have the bottom left bunk that's mine nice i have seniority around here now that's nice so, i was gonna say well like done. you <laughs> no matter what time of day or night you stumble onto the bus it's just i just gotta let hit bottom left yeah. and i'm good right now I get to be the guy running around going, listen, new guy, you're not, <laughs> you're not taking that bunk. I mean, it seems like <laughs> you guys have had a pretty, yes, there have been change outs in the band, but it's been a pretty consistent lineup for a while now, hasn't it? Well, I mean, the current lineup has probably got about three years in its current configuration. Right. We, we went through a period there where um, um, Jason left and then Jeff Coffey came in. And so then it was kind of the, that was only for about a year and a half. And then Tris and Jeff left. And then we had to replace those two guys with three guys. So, um, well, Fredo, who was our percussionist, uh, moved over to drums then we hired Ray Eastlas to play percussion. Then we got Neil to sing the tenor vocals and Brett to play bass. So it was a little bit of a shakeup there when Jeff and Tris left. But um, no, I mean, we're, you know, the funny thing about this band is, is they, you know, they don't hire anybody that's a, a hack. <laughs> you know what I mean? Imagine that. So mm-hmm. it's, it's always good musicians. And so, you know, you can go on Facebook and watch people argue over, oh, well, I like Jeff Coffey. Oh, I like Jason. Bring Jason back. Oh, no. Neil's the best. You know, it's like there's always argument of, you know, with the exception of the original guys. And that's pretty much if you go on to any kind of social media um, for any band, anybody that's not an original member is always, you know, available for intense criticism <laughs> right. right so i mean we're on, a, oh, 
Right. Sorry, I was going to say Ron Wood is still considered. He says he's the new guy in the Stones, and he's only been there thirty-five years now. Isn't that funny? <laughs> so, and you've—I mean, to say nothing of the guy that you replaced. I mean, I uh, was just watching the documentary on on the band, and so much of the early success and the heartbeat of that group was what Terry Kath brought to that band. And so you've got some very, very big shoes to fill. Well, I like to always say that um, the shoes that I had to fill were also worn and tried on by Chris Pinnock, Donnie Dacus, Dwayne Bailey. I didn't have the un uh, in it, uh, uh, unenviable, <laughs> yeah, unenviable task of having to step straight into Terry Kath's shoes. Mm -hmm. you know, that would have been, that would have been rough, but I had a three guitar player buffer between me and him. <laughs> so that kind of um, took a little bit of the, the load off on that one. You know, like when Jason came into the band, I mean, he was 23 years old and he stepped right into Peter Cetera's spot. And that was the comparison, you know, and that's tough. And he was 23. He was a kid. Yeah, you know, I was thirty. Um, still, still a kid. <laughs> <laughs> this is my, <laughs> this is my twenty seventh trip around the sun with these guys. That's crazy. I'm not, a, I'm not a young buck anymore. <laughs> None of us are. But that, you know, also to to kind of your earlier points about you know how the, the everyone's up for that criticism whenever anyone new comes in but when you see your shows it certainly doesn't translate to them not wanting to be there I mean your band is so beloved you have come in and just I think for any group of musicians with an intensive incredible musicians that you guys have and putting it out and all of that to maintain and continue to grow your fan base is unreal. Yeah, you know, um, the one thing I will say, you know, and I'm not going to point fingers at any legacy acts or anybody, but but I, I do feel that, you know, this band has consistently brought an energetic um, show right. and, you know, we don't sound like a, like a, like an old band, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I was just actually watching um, on YouTube. I saw a couple clips of uh, my buddies over in the Doobie brothers who are, who are out right now with Michael McDonald back in the saddle and man, they are throwing down. I mean, I was so proud of them. Michael McDonald sounds exactly the same as he ever did. I mean, his voice is in top form. He's He's got to be in his early 70s, but he's incredible. So, you know, sometimes the uh, the wine ages well, I guess, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, to that point, it seems, too, that the earlier incarnations of this band threw down a pretty large gauntlet for anyone coming after to try to pick up. Yeah, like you were talking about the energy of the shows and the fact that it's, you know, you can't really coast, like that you've just got to go out there and you see it from, you know, all the footage of, of the band playing throughout the years. Like there is a level of, like you said, professionalism and mastery of the instrument that this is not a uh, figure it out once we get out there. Now, there's no coasting in this band. <laughs> it just really, there really isn't. And, and the music demands a lot of attention you know this is not a uh, a three chord pop band this is you know there's there's a lot going on you gotta gotta pay attention and uh but it's really uh it, you know i wouldn't have it any other way because you know i'd probably want to shoot myself if i was in like i won't name any names but just some <laughs> other <You> could <laughs> some other some other band with sort of just trite songs with nothing chord changes and you know the music is so complex that because people have asked me a number of times you know well tell me one song that you're absolutely sick of playing that you just wish you never had to play it again 
and I can't really, I can't really name anything. You know, they, they, the musicianship is so good that it's so much fun to play, you know, the songs mm-hmm. uh, and the material is so good that, you know, even after, I mean, I've probably played, let's see, hundred shows a year, 27 years. I've probably played Saturday in the park 2,700 times, you know, <laughs> but it's still fun, you know, plus the crowd reacts and, you know, and that's always a, a great thing. And 25 or six to four, of course, with the longest guitar solo known to man. <laughs> that's always, yes. that's always exactly. fun. <laughs> How long did it take you from joining to figure all right, I feel pretty confident about going out here and doing this. Just to learn the style and the, you know, to say nothing of just chord progressions. You know what? I I grew up listening to this band. It was in my DNA, you know, pretty much. Um, So when when I got called for the audition or when I, when I busted in on the audition, (laughs) um, you know, it was kind of like being home for me. It was like the, the music was, like I say, it was ingrained in me. All I really needed to do was just kind of sit down and get it under my hands because it was all up here. And, um, you know, except for the, you know, the first few shows where I was just sort of, um, I don't know if terrified is the right word, <laughs> but I mean, we, we had one rehearsal before I played my first live show with the band. That's, and, and we played through the set and, you know, they had booked a week of rehearsals. And we, the first day we played through the show and all the guys looked at each other and went, I don't know, see you in Vegas. And I went, um, can we play through the show one more time, please? So we did a, a second run through. And then the next time I played with the group was like three and a half weeks, you know, later in Vegas. And um, I practiced a lot, though. I was going to say, what was that lead up like, like those three weeks on your own? Was, was it just morning, noon, night practicing or was it just already so in your soul? It was not too bad. It was I was putting in probably six, seven hour days, days playing these songs over and over and over. I wanted to make sure that it was so ingrained that you know once the the lights hit me i wasn't gonna you know flip out and forget so you know but that's the last time i ever had to rehearse that hard <laughs> you know now now right. i'm probably uh, um, guilty of maybe let's just say during the pandemic in that year and a half we were off i didn't pick my guitar up very often you know i kind of had to I kind of had to work myself back into shape about a week before we went back out on the road you know i got got the guitar on and started playing and you know my fingers were bleeding and my calluses were gone and you know but <clears throat> it came back so i'm okay now <laughs> how often do you guys change up the set list because jimmy buffett has what he refers to as the songs he has to play if he wants to leave the venue alive and you guys certainly have a list of songs that people are expecting to hear, but how much outside of that do you guys get to kind of play around with stuff? How much of it is, is it the kind of original members being like, let's dig this up. Or is it the new guys being like, you know what? I would love to take a shot at something off, you know, the second or third record. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if you're aware or not, but a couple, three years ago, I think four years ago, we, we did the entire second record as the first set of our show, right? Mm -hmm. And then did a greatest hits thing in the second set. And even I, as degenerate of a fan of all the obscure stuff, was thinking to myself, really? I'm not sure about this, you know? How is this gonna go over? And you saw people posting online saying things like, all they did for the first set was their new music. You know, they didn't even realize that it was, you know, an old album or, um, and, you know, and then the hardcore fans that always are critical that we don't do enough deep cuts, you know, we did that essentially for them. 
and now they're still complaining about the fact that now the set is kind of they never do anything different it's like well, weren't you there three years ago we did a lot different but um you know i i've, I've lobbied from time to time and say you know hey can we can we like just find a slot in a show where maybe we like rotate just an obscure album cut you know just maybe have four or five of them rehearsed and just rotate them night to night you know and then the fans will get excited about it and they don't seem to want to you know these guys have learned over the years and it's funny i've been in the band long enough now that i i like say i used to kind of be kicking and screaming about you know oh we've got to play you know, there was a year it was like 2001 i think i'd been in the band six years and, and and i got actually lobbied and got hit by verez from the fifth album put into the set which is you know odd time and and you know a lot of improvisation horn solos we played it twice and they went mm, it's not working people were getting up to go get drinks and you know so we pulled it um and you know supposedly years and years ago terry kath um, in the seventies wanted to go out on the road and do nothing but sort of like, um, I don't know if I'd call it jazz improv, but like, you know, more jammy, just long extended improvisations and that kind of thing. And they were losing their audience. And at that point, you know, they realized you know, that worked in like 1969, but in 1975, after all the hits the band had had, pe people were coming to hear Saturday in the Park and just you and me. And, you know, they want those. Con so much to their dismay, you know, we've got. I could sit here and probably put you together a set list. Of hit songs that were not playing yes, that, that could that could support a show right you, you know what i mean i mean we're not playing uh i don't want to live without your love um you're not alone along comes a woman love me tomorrow um gosh stay the night um baby what a big surprise no tell lover i mean there's tons of hit songs that we can't even fit in and we're doing two and a half hour show <laughs> you know nice problems so, to have i mean it's those are <laughs> right quality problems indeed Fabulous. you know and then but we're doing things like uh you know like introduction and uh you know there's there, there are things in there that are a little more proggy doing the whole ballet you know mm -hmm. 12 minutes of twiddly bits and hits yeah. <laughs> So. <laughs> See, nobody's getting up to get beer then no not well yeah. <laughs> somebody's always getting up beer. That's, yes, true. that's true i mean it doesn't matter what you're playing somebody's getting up for beer i <laughs> can't help it <laughs> I, I have to i almost I almost jumped in on a thread on on uh, facebook uh, yesterday you know, some people just, um, you know, the band's been around for, what, 54 years, right? So as one guy just kept, it was in a thread, and this guy just kept chiming in and saying, they're, they're just a cover band. They're just a cover band. They're just a cover band. Bring Peter, Danny, and, you know, uh, Donnie Dacus back. They're just a cover band. And it's like... I wanted to just reply and say, please don't come see us. Thank you. You know, <laughs> right? Just, just guess what? We're doing just fine without you. You know, and do, do you and the fact of the, chime and in? the fact and the fact of the matter is, um, the majority of the material that we're playing on the in, in the current set was either written by Robert Lamb or James Panko. And they're both on stage, right? And then right. Lee, who's also an original member playing trumpet, and he also wrote a couple of the hits that we're playing. So the only guy that's not standing up there that wrote, wrote stuff would be Terry Kath and 
rest in peace, he can't come back. Right. And Peter Cetera, who is retired. Yeah. So, you know. What are you gonna do? Can't please everybody else. You ever time. you can't. Have you ever chimed in? Positive or negative? Have you ever just started chatting in only, one of those threads with fans? Only positively. Yeah. I try to stay away from, you know. But even positively, they have to freak out when you respond. Like that has to be the coolest thing ever. I, I've jumped in on occasion. Um Tris, our drummer from previously, he used to get heavily involved in some of those. And he he would he would kind of shut people down. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty funny to see because then all of a sudden people are like apologizing and oh no 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 right you didn't really mean <laughs> it was a joke didn't really mean that. <laughs> somebody hacked my page <laughs> it's funny when you get people that are just sitting at their computer you know and, and can hide behind a you know screen name and i mean this one guy i swear i mean what a waste of time this guy literally posted it was in a thread that probably lasted for like four hours and they're just a cover band. I'll never go see them. They're just a cover band. I'll never. It's like, what kind of life do you have? You know, what's the point with doing that? When you always see those things of somebody doing that or somebody being just very negative and sort of like trying to kind of just undercut everybody. And then when somebody in this instance from the band goes, well, we're good then. Suddenly this like realization of, oh, I didn't realize that you guys were looking at this like like right. i didn't think that. right right <laughs> they don't realize that the band's actually seeing it right and when you're on the bus ride for seven hours you got nothing else to do but sit there <laughs> and read this stuff right well you know what I, i've i've learned over the years too to try not to um you know i know guys that actually go around digging for that kind of stuff you know they want to they want to find they're looking for the you know the positive things but then they come across the negatives too right. and, and the fact of the matter is, is none of us are going to come off unscathed right. and you know and i i learned a long time ago that if you're gonna if you're gonna read your good press and then wear it and feel good about it then you have to read your bad press and kind of wear that too so you know <clears throat> i know it was another thing I had to learn a, a number of years ago that um, I know when I've had a good night, when I've had a bad night. And I know when I feel, feel good about how I played or how I performed and when I didn't. And fortunately, there's less bad nights than good nights. But every once in a while, you're a little, your biorhythms are off, you're a little off your game, whatever. And in a band of 10 guys, nobody really notices because, you know, you're being carried by everybody else. And, you know, somebody will come up to me after the show and say, oh, man, you sounded great tonight. And, and my, my, I used to say, like, nah, you know, I didn't have a good show tonight. And then I realized, you know, what I'm basically what I'm saying is you don't know what you're talking about. You know, mm -hmm. by it's almost insulting to say that. So I learned now to keep that to myself and just say, thank you. You know, glad you enjoyed the show. Now I'm going to go on the bus and cry. <laughs> <laughs> so in doing, obviously, we're fans of the band, but doing research and, and all of that in reading the, your bio on the band's website is my probably my favorite bio I've ever read on any website ever. Well, and <laughs> I don't I need to maybe I need to get out more. I might need to read more, but <laughs> it was fantastic. It's long. And, I, and your story, but it's great. The detail is there and you get a feel for who you are and how you're, you know, the story of how you did your you know, force your way into the audition or however you want to praise, praise it. I mean, it's a, one of those legendary rock stories and even your um, you know, encounter with Peter Cetera years ago. But I want to know if you ever still channel your Karen Carp, your inner Karen Carpenter. Oh, she's always in there, of course. Um, sometimes I'll wrap the microphone cord around my, my fingers just for uh, 
whole time big. I've got pictures of me when I was like seven, seven years old, you know, channeling my inner Karen Carpenter back before my voice changed. Actually, my voice probably higher than hers at that point. But um, no, I was, uh, the Carpenters were probably the first, the Carpenters and the Beatles. Um, and, you know, the Beatles, I kind of came into the party a little bit late. It was like I had the, the Beatles' greatest hits, you know, so I knew all the, I knew all the hits, but I wasn't like deep into the catalog, like the, like Jimmy and Robert and Lee and those guys, you know, like when they, when they all dropped acid and listened to Starch and Peppers that like changed the band forever. They were, they were actually a show band at the, at that point, you know, with suits and ties. Mm -hmm. When Sar literally when Sergeant Pepper came out and they heard that record, they went back to the club and Terry Kath said, you know, screw this. The suits are coming off. We're playing our own material. No more Motown hits. And they got fired from the club, of course, for doing that. But it set them on a path, you know, when they heard, you know, when they heard Got to Get You Into My Life and, you know, with the horns and they were like, that's what we got to be doing. But um, how did that relate to me? Oh, the Carpenters just, you know, that was probably one of the first groups that um, their vocal harmonies in particular, you know, were just off the chain. Richard Carpenter's vocal arrangements and the way they, um, the way they stacked that stuff up, you know, I cut my teeth on that stuff. And then, and then in came Chicago and, um, you know, that was a whole other I'll never forget the day, you know, my brother brought home Chicago 2. I had heard, does anybody really know what time it is, beginnings on the radio, but um, my brother brought Chicago 2 home in quadraphonic stereo, four speakers, you know, and we sat right in the middle of his bedroom and listened to it. And the horns were coming from back there and the, the band was up here and we were, we were knocked out. I saw you've got this ridiculously large box set of the Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Hall shows coming out soon. Mm -hmm. Is there any plans to sort of recreate those sets? Because that seems such a le legendary and uh, wow step to in, in the band's lifestyle or in the in the band status. Like those shows seem to be pretty I, legendary. I doubt it. I haven't heard any rumblings of that. Um, I haven't even heard it. To be honest with you, nobody's mm. given me copy of it yet so you don't know anyone I'll, I'll, I'll be curious <laughs> i'll be curious to hear it though um because you know that record always for me was you know the audio quality was kind of mm, not great the horn mm -hmm. sounded real thin and small and um that room is not really made for a rock band carnegie hall mm -hmm. you know and they were a rock band so I don't know what whatever Lee and Tim Jessup did to kind of clean it up and make it sound warmer and fatter and bigger and um, plus you know they had they recorded every night they were there and I, I don't remember how many nights it was but um, you know so they cherry picked the performances for the one record so you, you actually get to hear um, you know variations on the the theme as it were. I'll be, that's what I'll be curious to hear because I know, um, you know, Terry was sort of a, a wild child in the sense that I don't, I don't think he really ever played anything the same way twice. I'm sure there were hints of the same stuff, but when he was soloing and stuff, I think he was just kind of flying off the cuff and just letting it go. I tend to be a little bit more, um, I find things that work and kind of stick with them, you know, so I'm not quite as, um, but then again, the band is a little different now than it was back then, you know, it was, um, um, so I'll be just kind of curious to hear from a, almost like a, a jam band perspective, just how much they veered off from all these different songs night to night and just did different things because you know, I'm sure, you know, back then there, there were no, there was nothing confining you with a, an arrangement like a click track or anything like that. So they could, mm. 
one night the solo could be 16 bars, the next night it could be 48 bars, the next night maybe they'd go on for five minutes, you know, until they came back around into the tune. So, you know, the more jazz inflected stuff would be interesting for me to hear to just see how how much they varied because I, I i saw the band several times back in their heyday and and uh you know they were amazing in every incarnation i saw you know i liked them all personally <laughs> you know i saw the chicago 16 tour it was right when Hard to Say I'm Sorry came out. It was at my at my college. I was a freshman in college, and um, that was the Peter Cetera story. How do you sing so? You rolled the window up on me, but um, but uh, that was when Champlin was like brand new in the group, and Chris Pinnock was brand new in the group, and they they had a fire under them because they they'd had a couple of albums that didn't do really well and. All of a sudden, they were having this resurgence. And um, yeah, the band was on fire. Peter was singing great. Danny was playing great. Chris Pinnock was shredding. It was cool. And I, I think probably in my bio, it said in there, you know, I, I kind of was hanging out, looking looking into the stage doors backstage, um, thinking about what a lucky guy Chris Pinnock was. I could see him smoking a cigarette and just kind of walking around. It's like, wow, he's got the best gig in the world. He gets to play with Chicago. So, and then God decided to mock me. And now 27 years later. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. <laughs> Chris, Chris was in the band for three years. So, you know. But uh, no, it's been a, it's been an incredible ride and I'm still enjoying it. You know, the peripherals of being on the road, the seven hour bus rides, the, the, you know, being away from family, um, you know, that's gotten harder over the years um, mm -hmm. just by design. You know, that's kind of what they say, you know, that they don't pay us to play the music. They pay us to be out here traveling and, missing a lot of stuff and uh you know birthdays graduations you know so but the two hours on stage is always fun <clears throat> and that's what makes it worth it Chicago is on tour right now, so if you're looking to see Keith and the band in the Carolinas, Columbus, or Topeka, check out their website, chicagotheband.com. You can check us out on all the various socials. Be sure to visit our website at rockandrollgradschool.com, and don't forget to leave us a review. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant producers are John Sauvé and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thank you, good night, and may all your favorite bands stay together. <laughs>